Our scripture this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We'll be in chapter 6, looking at verses 10 through 20. I imagine some of y'all will remember this from Sunday schools from years past. Uh, So please hear the word of the Lord this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. And with all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for this word that you've given us uh, through your servant, the Apostle Paul, this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds, Lord, and our ears to whatever it is that you uh, would have us learn and that you would use our time in studying your word to shape us into disciples who look more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So, little association question for you guys this morning. When you see a ball like this, what do you think about? Anyone? Dodgeball. Man, you beat me to it. Yeah, some of you maybe were thinking four square, maybe a kickball. But when I see a ball like this, ready? There you go. I think about dodgeball. And I used to love dodgeball. When I was a middle school boy, a game of dodgeball would make my day. Okay, maybe even my week if I got to take down somebody I didn't like. But... um, (laughs) As much as I loved dodgeball growing up, you know, I liked it even more when I was an after-school and summer camp counselor, all right? For four years in college, uh, I worked for the YMCA in an after-school and summer camp program, and I used to love our dodgeball games. We had a very large program, like 130-plus kids in this after-school And we would have these massive games of dodgeball. You probably can't do this now, but we had like 100 kids playing at one time. And it was wild, and it was crazy, and it was hysterical. And I used to love to watch the kids plot and scheme and work together, right? Take somebody down, and then they'd be strutting around. And then, of course, somebody would take them out. And, I mean, we would just be rolling watching these games. But of course, as you can probably imagine, there was one thing that happened in every dodgeball game. No matter how much fun we had, somebody was going to end up crying, (laughs) right? Like, you just know it's going to happen at some point. Some kid is probably going to be standing in the back. They're not paying attention. Maybe they're talking to a friend. Or, of course, the worst would be they're trying to call time out or trying to talk to a counselor, and they're going to take it right in the face, right? Uh, And so, myself and the other counselors, we would always tell the kids, you know, you don't have to play, okay? But if you play, you need to watch out. You need to pay attention. If you are in this game, you are a target. And there's no timeouts, and there's no safe spaces. 
And don't try to talk to us while those balls are flying around, okay? Just wait till you're off the court. We would always give them that little speech. And so this morning, my goal is to join the Apostle Paul in giving you guys that same advice. You need to watch out and you need to pay attention. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, if you spend the rest of your time daydreaming about your dodgeball glories or maybe reliving your traumas, uh, please hear this. You do not live in a spiritually neutral world. Okay, there is an enemy. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, he's after you. Okay, well, how does Paul describe or name the, the, these enemies that we have? Right, what does he say? He says the devil, he says the rulers, the authorities, the forces or cosmic powers of darkness, forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, the heavenly places, Paul's point is saying, what, what that really means is it's not human. It's not flesh and blood. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. Yet there are these evil things out there and they're after you. Now, this raises all kinds of questions, right? Like we wanna know, okay, so tell us more. Like when you say the cosmic powers of darkness, Paul, what are you really talking about? But the thing is, the New Testament is really not interested in us knowing the details about this. We would like to know, and people, frankly, like they go really overboard with some of this, uh, but the New Testament isn't interested in us knowing. It's kind of like how I am with my boys in germs, okay? Zach and Mac, they don't need to be virologists at this point, you know? Like they don't need to know how a virus replicates inside a cell. What they need to know is that there are germs out there. So we wash our hands. We don't share water bottles. We're trying not to chew on our clothes, right? <laughs> because those things get you sick. Likewise, the New Testament and Paul and Jesus for that matter, we're never trying to give an explanation for what this evil is all about. But they were all crystal clear. It's there. And you need, to, you need to be aware of it, and you need to know how to respond to it. And that's what this passage is about. But it does raise these questions for us, and so what I'd like for us to do is think through some of these questions through the lens of this passage this morning. So I think, anyways, the first thing, the first question that pops into my mind, okay, you say, Paul, that there are these uh, evil forces against us. There's a conflict. We find ourselves in a spiritual conflict. Well, how intense is this conflict? Well, Paul says, remember me in chains. Now, that could be in times just a rhetorical flourish, but Paul, we know from Acts, was literally chained in a dungeon at some points in his ministry. So that tells you right up front, it can be pretty intense. And I think then, uh, when we start thinking about, well, where might spiritual conflict be intense in our world, it's natural to think, well, places where there's overt persecution. You know, you think about a place like North Korea or China, you think about the Middle East, and you'd be like, man, there definitely is some intense spiritual conflict. And I, w I, I would agree with that. But the thing is, if we think it's only overt hostility and persecution, we misunderstand the enemy we have. You see, the enemy is not out to make Christian martyrs. That doesn't help him. What he's about is destroying and discrediting our faith. Okay? What he's about is sowing lies into our lives. Right? And sowing bitterness and hard-heartedness and unforgiveness and jealousy and fill in, right, with all of the common sins, right, that, that scripture points to. All those things into our lives, fear into our lives, with the goal of pulling us away from the love of God. That's what he's after. He wants to remove us from the love of God, to remove the love of God from us. 
right? To get us to stop living as God's children, to break fellowship with each other, to break our relationships with God, to break relationships with the people we love and with our neighbors. He's trying to get us to live like the rest of the world. Paul talks about that as living in the flesh. That's what he's after. You see, if he can get us living in the flesh, man, that's mission accomplished. He doesn't need to persecute, right? He doesn't need to make martyrs. He wins when that happens, right? Then we've lost our faith and we discredit our faith. Now, when we recognize that, that that's what he's after, and that's how he operates, then we might see, wow, it could be pretty intense here too. All right, so you say, fair enough, John, there's a conflict and it can be pretty intense. Well, who, who exactly is a target? Now, typically, when I've heard people talk about spiritual warfare, like the first thing that people think, and, and, and that I've thought is, man, pastors or elders, deacons, like church boards, missionaries, in other words, leaders, like they really need to be on, on the lookout for this. And again, that's true. But who's Paul talking to in this passage? I mean, who's he writing to? He's not just writing to the leaders. It's interesting. In the passage immediately preceding this one, he's talking to husbands and wives. He's talking to children and parents, to slaves and masters, to old and young. He's talking to everybody in this church. And when he wrote this letter, you know, most of them couldn't read. This letter would have been read to the entire church together, probably more than once. This was a message for every single one of them. So it was just like that dodgeball game. If you're in the game, you're a target. It doesn't matter if you're standing at the front or trying to hide in the back. If you're in the game, you're a target. Okay, so we say, all right, so we got this conflict. It can be intense. Everyone who's a disciple of Jesus is in this conflict, whether they want to be or not. Well, when might this conflict happen? Like, when do we need to be prepared for this? And Paul tells them, you know, his hope and prayers for them to stand firm on that evil day. Now, unfortunately, that evil day is not a specific day. It's not the day of persecution. It's not the day of judgment. Paul's point is just, hey, it's whenever it happens. So there's no advance warning, which is too bad. I mean, I really wish we had it. Uh, I really wish God would put on my cell phone an app and I would get like a notification, bing, like 15 minutes before, or maybe even just like pro football, just give me two minutes, right? Like a little bing, Uh, your coworker is about to be overly critical and harsh and judging, and you are gonna be tempted to throw it right back in their face, right? Or uh, bing, an extended family member is about to say something hurtful, and totally uncalled for, and you are going to be tempted to pull out that list of things they did wrong and revisit it point by point, right? Or whatever it is for you. But we don't get that. We don't get time granted to us, a warning then to prepare ourselves that, oh yeah, I'm not against flesh and blood. And I need to respond as a child of God in love, in the power of of the Holy Spirit, whatever that means in, in, in my context. We don't get that warning. So, as reasonable people, uh, relatively reasonable people, reasonable people, right? Us as a group. If we know we are in a conflict, we have an enemy, we're a target, We don't know when the attack's coming. What might we do? What should we do? Well, number one, we need to watch out, right? You need to pay attention. And number two, whatever protective equipment you have, you put it on, right? That bulletproof vest 
is no help to the police officer once the bullets start flying if he doesn't already have it on. The soldiers in a combat zone, they don't wait till the bombs start dropping to put the helmets on. When you enter the combat zone, man, you gotta be ready to go. And that's what Paul is telling the Ephesians, and that's what he's telling us to this morning. We have to be ready, prepared, for the spiritual conflict that is coming. Now, the beautiful thing, if all of this sounds like, whoa, John, this is like super intense and uh, I just don't know if I'm ready. Uh, Maybe I'm anxious about this. You know, we can all breathe out. The beautiful thing about this and why this is good news, this passage, is God knows all about this, right? God knows we're in this conflict, right? And God has given us all we need for this conflict. I'm going to talk about uh, the armor of God, but, you know, you could just sum it up by saying God has given us through his grace, through his gifts, all we need for this. As his children, he has given us what we need to be protected, and that's beautiful. So we don't have to be afraid and we can be confident as we face this. But what exactly has, has he given us? Okay, so Paul starts by uh, mentioning, and I should say before we go into it, uh, of course, he is using the metaphor of a Roman soldier. Okay, that would be uh, the image of conflict in their world. You think about a Roman soldier. So Paul's like, hey, the first thing you got is the belt of truth. What is the primary tool of the enemy? It's lies. But God has given us the truth. We have the gospel. We have the scriptures. We have the faith that has been passed down to us. And it's that truth that's at the very center, right? It holds everything together. He goes, he goes beyond that, and he talks about the breastplate of righteousness, and I'm gonna pull, go ahead and pull in the helmet of salvation. Listen, God has already given us salvation. If we are disciples of Jesus, he has given us that salvation. It was his free gift to us. Likewise, his own righteousness, he has brought us into right relationship with him. Now, the important thing here is those are gifts of God to us. Those aren't things we earned or did by our own own power. Therefore, The devil can't take them from us. The powers of darkness can't take those things from us. He he has us protected. Just like the soldier, man, you got the helmet, you got the breastplate. As long as you don't take those things off, you're covered. And so are we. God's gifts cover us. And then Paul says he's given us the shield of faith. Now, a Roman soldier would have had two options for a shield. There's a small shield for sword fighting, right? So you could move it. uh, Or there's a really big body length shield. That's what Paul's talking about. The shield of faith is this big old shield that, in other words, it can block anything they throw at us. And Paul, he talks about the flaming darts, Uh, In other words, the flaming arrows, right, that that would have been shot at soldiers. And the cool thing about these big Roman shields, they were covered with leather. And the point of that is leather is a natural flame retardant. In other words, those arrows might look scary, but they can't hurt you. They can't get through that shield. Likewise, when we hold on to that trust, that faith, that God through his spirit empowers in in us, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be driven by anxiety or scarcity to do things in the flesh, to play into the enemy's hands. We don't have to do that. We don't have to be afraid. And Paul says you've been, or put onto your feet whatever prepares you to announce the gospel of peace. The Roman army, they were marching everywhere under the banner of making peace, right? Supposedly, you've probably heard of the Pax Pax Romana, right? The Roman peace. They said, we go into the conflict to make peace. Well, that's us. 
we've been given peace by God and we get to announce peace. We help people have peace with God and have peace with each other. And then finally, the sword of the spirit, right? And this isn't like a giant brave heart sword. Uh, sorry, guys. A uh, Roman soldier, this would be more like a dagger. But the point is, if you get close enough, we can finish you off. The Lord has given us his word. Again, it's back to the truth that ultimately the enemy cannot withstand the truth that God has given us. So we're equipped for this battle that we face. The Lord, his grace is enough for us in this. All right, so you say, well, cool, John, that sounds great. I'm ready, but how do I put those things on? Paul, he's urging them to equip themselves with the armor of God. How do we put those things on? Well, where does this passage end? It's all about prayer, right? He says, pray in every supplication in the spirit, pray for me, pray for the saints. We pray and we ask God before we go into the conflict, hey, prepare me for anything that's gonna be thrown at me. Cover me, Lord, with your grace, with your protection. We pray and he will prepare us. And here, here's the thing, Paul isn't the only one who's talking about praying about this. Does anybody remember the last line from the, the Lord's Prayer? Or I shouldn't say the last line, what's the last petition in the Lord's Prayer? Go for it, anybody? Deliver us from evil. Actually, Bible scholars, theologians would tell you a better translation would be deliver us from the evil one. It's right there. And Jesus doesn't only tell us to pray it, Jesus actually prays it for us. His last prayer for his disciples before he's arrested, John 17, 15, he's praying and he says, Father, I have sent them into the world. Don't take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one. Well, I figure if Jesus is praying that for me, I probably should too. And I should pray it for my brothers and sisters. We pray it for each other. Which then leads us to the last point. You know, when Paul's original audience heard him talk about the armor of God, they would not have pictured one solo soldier. You see, the Roman army, they didn't send people to fight solo. It wasn't guys charging off into battle by themselves. What they pictured was a unit standing together, standing firm and holding their ground together. That's what Paul is calling them to, and that's what God's calling us to. You know, when that Roman army was under pressure, when they were under attack, everybody had to hold the line, right? The defensive integrity of the whole legion depended on everyone working together to hold the line. So if somebody was hurt, if somebody was wounded, man, they got those shields in front of them. If somebody was afraid, the veterans grabbed a hold of them and they encouraged them and they exhorted them. If somebody was tired and straggling, man, they dragged them into that line. They fought together. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the people of God are called to do is to stand firm together, to pray for each other, to speak truth to each other, to hold each other accountable, but also to offer that word of encouragement and forgiveness to get back in line and to remember, we're not called to win this fight. He's not, Paul's not telling them go win the fight. Jesus wins the fight, okay? Jesus has already won this war. He is the battle leader. He is the commander who's out front. Our calling is to stand firm, fix our eyes ahead on him, make sure we're prepared, we're equipped, and we're, we're working together, and we got this. God's got us. It's just up to us to love each other and call each other to continually stand so that we get to be a part of the victory that Jesus has already won for us. Let's pray.
Lord, we love you and uh, we praise you because you've already won this thing. Lord, you have already defeated the devil. You've defeated evil. Lord, you have already uh, forgiven us. You've reconciled us. Lord, you've saved us. And so help us, Father, to have courage, uh, Lord, for whatever it is that we're facing right now that is making us anxious, that is tempting us, Lord, that is pushing us to act in the flesh, Lord, to act against flesh and blood. Remind us, Lord, uh, that we are in a conflict. And remind us uh, each day, Lord, especially in this season of Lent, in this time of focus on prayer, uh, remind us of our need for your protection. And Lord, encourage us and spur us as a body, as a church, Lord, to pray for each other, to be about protecting each other, to be about encouraging each other, uh, Lord, in helping each other to hold that line that you've called us to. And Father, equip us so that we're ready to, to follow in the steps of your son, to be ready, Lord, to show love when it's hard, to speak a word of truth and forgiveness when it's hard, and to demonstrate what is peace and what is courage, Lord, when we're under fire. And Lord, we confess, you know, on our own devices, we're not up to that. But God, we trust you, that you've given us what we need and you're present with us and you are always at work amongst us, empowering us, uh, Lord, to be those disciples who you've called us to be. So God, we place ourselves and we place our church into your hands, Lord. And we ask that you would fix our eyes ahead in this season, uh, Lord, and prepare us to hold the line together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.